thank you all for being here. Thank you, those who are visiting with us. We appreciate your being here. And hope that you'll come back and be with us any and every opportunity you have. As was read just a moment ago, Exodus 17 will be the focus of our lesson this evening. The children of Israel have been out of Egyptian bondage just a little while, and they have already experienced a lot of a lot of things. I mean, just crossing the Red Sea and and finally being free, and then they run into one problem right after another, and it was kind of discouraging. But at the same time, it was an amazing time for them to remember the awesome power of God and and that Moses could hold up the stick and open up the Red Sea. Wow. This was, this was tremendous. A lot of things were contained in this little stick that Moses was holding up. And a lot of power because that represented the power of God. It wasn't in Moses. If Moses just picked up a stick on his own, it would have done nothing to say the many things that he had been able to do because God put power in that little stick called a rod. It's amazing to think about it. Sometimes we are wandering through a wilderness of life, and we are, we all have our problems, difficulties that we face. But as we go through the wilderness, we have the rod of God with us. And I want us to see that point. That even though sometimes we lose our spiritual sense of direction. Jesus had talked about the fact that sometimes our life is like, like that, that. That the cares of the world sometimes just choke out the word. It was powerful at one time, but... But we let the cares of the world kind of choke it out so that the power is no longer there. We, we lose our sense of spiritual direction and now we're focused on the world and the cares of the world. And we just don't know how to regain the ground that we've lost. And I know that has happened to me numbers of times. And I know it has to happen to you too from time to time. So what we want to do is look at this and see the lesson that God wanted the children of Israel to see, especially as it became fulfilled in the reality of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see how that impacts or should impact us in our own walk of life. So let's read the text again. This time, let's notice in Exodus chapter 17. Let's notice some particular things as we go along. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So they are opposed. They haven't even made it to the promised land yet and already they have been opposed by an opponent who is ready to destroy them if they can. The Amalekites. And Moses says to Joshua, choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it was so when Moses held up his hand, holding the rod, of course, that as long as he was holding up the rod, what happened down on the field, the battlefield, was that Israel would start winning. They would win as long as Moses was holding up the rod. But when Moses got tired and he let the rod down, it says... And when he let down his hand, the Amalekites prevailed. Now, why did God let this happen? Not just a little story that God put in there and it had no significance. It had lots of significance to it. And there was a good reason for putting it in there. Because he wanted to teach us a a lesson about the realities that we would find in Jesus Christ. 
And so it was that when he let his ha- held the rod up, we won. When we let the rod down, we lost. As simple as that. But Moses' hands became heavy. Can you imagine holding it up for hours, watching the people of God win? But, man, this is getting tired. I can't hardly just hold my hand up for very long until I start, hey, this is getting, I, I don't, I'm not used to this. And it starts to get very heavy. Well, Moses' hands became heavy. So, the people who were with him, they said, well, let's, let's get Moses in a better position now. So, they set him down on a rock. They took a stone, verse 12 says, and put it under him for him to sit on. He sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other. Why? Because we got to support Moses, otherwise he's going to let that rod down, and as soon as he lets the rod down, then our side is going to be losing, and we can't have that. So let's support Moses so that he can keep the rod up. And they steadied his hands, verse 12 says, until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek. And his people with the edge of the sword. They otherwise would not have won. The power was not in their battle skills. It was in whether or not the rod of God was held up or whether it was not. And verse 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Now the clincher here in verse 15 is that Moses built an altar and named its name, The Lord is Our Banner. The Lord is My Banner. Let's correct that. The Lord is My Banner. Now, what does that mean? That means as long as we have got the lifted up power of God that we can always look back to and look up to it, then as long as we've got that, then we're we're winners. The Lord is my banner. A banner is an emblem, a a flag that has your, your family's coat of arms, so to speak. Your emblem is, is on it. The colors of, of your choice for your family are represented there. If you're in a, in a group of a million people and you want to know, well, where's my tribe? Where, where's my family? Well, the family had a, had a banner and they put it up on high up so anybody anywhere could see, well, that's where Issachar is and that's Zebulun over there and, and that's Dan's flag over there and there's Gad's and And you could just pick out which tribe you were from and and look at the banner and go right to it. And so you would not have to be lost among the millions of people that were there in the wilderness. That's a great thing to have the banner. Well, this particular story was set in place because God wanted us to learn something and remember something the rest of our lives. And what is that lesson? Well, there are several of these throughout the Old Testament. At Marah in chapter uh, 16, or rather 15, at Marah we recall in the hearing, uh, uh, the healing rather, of the uh, children of Israel when they got to this bitter water, and they were disappointed because they were thirsty and and they got there and it was bitter. It was not something that you could drink. And so what the Lord told them and showed Moses is here's a tree. Now you just throw that tree in that bitter water. And he threw it in there and the water became sweet. Now, God didn't make that happen just to be a little interesting. He wanted us to do that because he wanted us to learn something from it. And so at, Mar- at Marah... The healing of the bitter waters at that place revealed God as a God who heals. So so from now on you're going to think of Jehovah uh, 
Rapha. And that term is going to make you recall that even in the midst of bitterness, if you put the tree in there, and that was a symbol of the tree that we have in Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ, then if you put the tree in there, then you will, you will be healed. It will not be impossible to drink. You can swallow it and it will turn into sweetness to you. Another occasion, of course, that you remember is every one of these events tells us something about God. In that one, he says, God heals. You just remember, God heals. Back in Genesis chapter 22, you remember when Abraham was told to offer his son Isaac, and they got up to the mountain that, on which he was to be offered. And you remember that uh, Isaac said, well, here's the wood, and, and here's the altar, and, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. And the name of that place then became known as Jehovah Jireh, which means Jehovah provides. And of course, he had in mind that day when God would provide himself a lamb, the lamb of God. Jesus Christ once again becomes the thing that is personified and depicted in the provisions that God was to provide in Jesus Christ. And so he is our healer and he's also our provider. At Rephidim, Moses builds an altar and he calls the name of it Jehovah Nissi, which means the Lord is my banner. Each one of these things are pointing to Jesus Christ as the greater thing than even the miracle that they experienced, even with the bitter waters, the tree, the cross of Jesus Christ is better than that. Even with God providing himself a lamb, the lamb that he presided, uh, provided was better than what Abraham could have offered in the place of, uh, of Isaac. And in this particular case, Rephidim, at Rephidim, when he says, the Lord is my banner, we're going to see a fulfillment of something even better than the winning of those physical battles on the field there in the wilderness uh, after they had left Egypt. The Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nissi. Remember this, all of these events names something about what is provided in Jesus Christ. The Lord provides healing, healing for our souls the Lord provides for our souls, and the Lord is the banner in our winning army. We've got the army of God, and this army wins because we have the Lord as our banner. I right, keep those three, three things in mind. Now, as I mentioned a while ago, this was a banner that you held up. And if you held it up, you knew where you were located and you knew where you were to go and, and what you were to do with your life. So in the book of Numbers, when, he, when they built the tabernacle and they were to surround themselves, put this tabernacle in the center, they were to each make their own flags as this is represented in the uh, depiction on the screen. Numbers 152 then says, And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp, and every man by his own standard. So a banner and a standard were the same thing. This is our standard for this tribe, and, and then the other one was a standard for the next tribe, or a banner with a, the standard that would say, This is our family, this is our tribe, and now you know your way home. You know where to go. All right, with that in mind, the Lord becomes our common standard here. I don't know what's happening in your life. And it really, as we just go around the room and think about what is happening different than in anybody's life, I know that there are times when we just lose our spiritual sense because of things that are happening to us and in us. So the Lord becomes the thing that gets us back on track. 
He becomes our standard. So I'm hoping now that as we look at this story, we'll understand what we're to do when you get disoriented and when you get discouraged or when you get down or when you think that you've lost your spiritual vitality and you've lost your spiritual direction and and whereas at one time you were on fire and you were working and you were involved, you've just kind of lost your way. Something has happened. Maybe some discouragement has happened and you've kind of lost your way. Well, let's just think about it. What has happened? First thing we need to recognize is that we've been under attack. Satan saw that. Remember Jesus saying saying to Peter, Peter, Satan has asked for you and he is going to sift you as wheat. What does he say? Well, what he's saying to Peter is that, Peter, just understand this, that Satan is looking for that weak spot. And he is going to hone in on it and he's going to take advantage of it. You are under attack. I don't know if you recognize that. I don't know if you understand that. But you are under attack. So the Lord in uh, Rephidim allowed the children of Israel to be under attack to represent to us that we are under attack. Satan sometimes takes advantage of our weak spot. In fact, he always does if he can. Well, the forces of this world are not going to help us. They're not going to work for us unless we know the standard. This world is opposed to God and wants to bring us down. And I'm not just talking collectively. Yes, the people of the world would like to bring this church down. But he's got to take, they've got to take down each individual. And then we've got to lose our sense of direction collectively. And if you lose your sense of direction individually, then you will become an influence to help others lose their sense of direction. And then it will be kind of like a domino effect. God's army is only going to win when you win. And you're only going to win when you hold up the standard. And when you know where to go to the standard. When you've not got at least a sense of memory of where to go. Where did it make things right? Where did it heal? Where did it make your life stronger? Your spiritual stamina stronger? Where did you go to find that? Well, in Ephesians chapter 6, you remember that we are, we're wrestling. We're in a warfare And it is a tough fight. As long as you hold up the standard, you're okay. Sometimes it may not seem like it's okay, but as long as you hold up the standard, you're okay. The forces of this world is going to try to bring you down. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, you remember Paul saying, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty weapons. And what they're able to do is they're able to bring down strongholds. And they're able to bring down all those imaginations that people have. And they're able to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, obeying Jesus Christ and thinking about the cross of Jesus Christ helps you become a winner in every battle. But if you forget that... And become disoriented and forget to look back to the standard, you'll lose your way. And you'll lose the battle. The world wants us to lose. But God wants us to win. Our walk with God is challenged by the world. The world challenges us on the issues of your values. Look at 1 Peter. Looking at 1 Peter chapter 4. And starting with verse 1, Peter says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us, remember he's taking us, our mind back to the standard, Christ suffered for us in the flesh. Now, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Arm yourselves. With what? Arm yourselves with this same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh 
has ceased from sin. That is, if, you have, if you've gotten to the point that you understand how significant suffering for Christ is, then you've already won the biggest battle of all, and that is your battle with sin. Because now you know where you're going, and you've ceased from sin, and now your only, only uh, goal in life is to maintain a mind that says, I'm willing to suffer for him. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. No longer. I've lived enough of my life doing the will of what everybody else says was cool. We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of of the Gentiles, which is just another way of saying doing what everybody else is doing. And we spent enough when we walked in licentiousness, when we walked in lust and drunkenness and revelries and drinking parties and abominable idolatries. We spent enough time with that. So the world is going to challenge us in regard to these, verse 4, they, that is those people of the world, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Now you've got to deal with people talking bad about you. The world is challenging you on your values, and you say to yourself, Jesus suffered for me, I can handle this. Jesus suffered for me, and I'm going to arm myself with that same mind that I'm willing to suffer for him. These people of the world who are ridiculing us, they're not going to suffer for us. All they're wanting to do is to discourage us. But the only one who loved you sufficiently that he gave his life for you, he laid his life on the line, is Jesus Christ. So arm yourself with that. The world is going to challenge, what do you value? What are your principles? Where do you get those principles? Do you get them from the world and what everybody else is doing? Or are you getting your principles from the one who loved you and gave his life for you? So our walk with God is challenged by this world, and they're going to try to laugh at you, they're going to try to undermine you, and they're going to try to talk evil about you, but you've got to know where you stand. The world challenges us on on the issue of faith in God. Do you believe in God? Well, we do. That's why I came to Jesus Christ, is because Jesus presented God to us in a way that we had not seen before, in the most real way. Jesus came and presented God to us, and his resurrection proved that he was God come in the flesh. And so we don't have to battle with that issue anymore. We know that our faith in God is based on strong, solid evidence. They're going to attack us there, but we're ready to meet. We're ready to answer every man who asks us a reason for the hope that is within us. Why? Because we've got the banner of the cross in mind and we know the evidence of that and therefore we can win the battles that we face. Well, the world challenges us on your passions and your emotions too. What are you, what are you passionate about? What do you feel strongly about? And what, what excites you? The world wants you to get excited about movies. Uh, wants you to get excited about sports. How, how passionate and emotional do you get when it comes to those kind of things? The world says, I can be more passionate about sports than you can about your Jesus. And the world sometimes is right. They are more passionate. Sometimes... We become more passionate about those things than we do about Jesus Christ and the cross. So the world is challenging you. You really believe in this Jesus? I challenge you to be more passionate about your Jesus than we are about our sports. Brethren, let's hang our heads in shame if we have more passion about sports and movies and things of that nature than we are about our faith in Jesus Christ. We are, we are going to win in the battle of life only to the extent that we know what we're about and where our standard is. 
Now, Isaiah had some more to say about this. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, we have this statement, starting with verse 1. Here's a prediction of the Messiah. I think it's interesting that he uses the term rod. There shall come forth a rod. What did Moses hold up? He held up a rod. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. This is going to be somebody who is descendant of Jesse. Jesse, of course, is the father of David. The branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. What was in Moses' stick? The power, the spirit of the Lord was resting in that rod. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon this rod that is coming, that would be of Jesse. The spirit of wisdom would be there. You want to know better? You want to understand and perceive things better? The spirit of wisdom is right here. The spirit of understanding is going to be right here. The spirit of counsel. You want somebody to counsel you, to direct you and give you some guidance and and some strength, might? Well, the spirit is going to be right here in this rod. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. You see, this is the rod of God that was to come in Jesus Christ. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Remember when Moses held up the rod, the wicked... Uh, enemies was was being slain by the children of Israel. Well, we'll slay the wicked when we have this rod, Jesus Christ. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. And then he goes on to talk about the peace that would come between common enemies, people that uh, that or animals that were formerly. Uh, total enemies would be together on this. And then in verse 10, And in that day there shall be the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. This root of Jesse, of course, is Jesus. And he is going to stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him. And so everybody who is going to be drawn to God and be given the power of God are going to have to be people who come to know Jesus Christ as the power and the wisdom of God. So with that in mind, let's flip over now to 1 Corinthians. Looking in 1 Corinthians. And what we have, let's just put this up. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. When he sits down, you know, they set Moses on a seat and said, now let's, let's station him so that he can keep holding up the rod. When Jesus sits down, his place of rest will be glorious. It will mean that he has supplied us with the tools of victory. Now with that in mind, remember Jesus' statement in John 12, 32. If I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. That is anybody who's going to be drawn and become a winner is going to have to be a person who knows Jesus Christ and knows what his being lifted up was all about. And once you lift him up, you become the winner. He draws all men to himself. Now I said turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice with me in chapter 1 that he had talked about the fact that these brethren were divided. 
when they were divided, they were going in the wrong directions. When they were divided, it was all about me and who I like and and, uh, and it's not a, it is not the idea of us working as a team. It's all about little individual cliques. So he writes to them and he says, I'm, I'm, I want you to have the same mind. Well, how can, you, how can you do that? How can you have the same mind and the same judgment? Well, notice verse 17. Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. He's not saying baptism is not essential. He's just saying that my mission that he sent me on was first that of preaching the gospel. Anybody, after I've preached the gospel, anybody can do the baptizing. That's that's not what my mission was. I'm, I'm there to plant the seed. You're to see to it that you're baptized. And you can get anybody to do that. But my mission is to preach the gospel. Why? Why is it so important, Paul, that you preach the gospel? And that you do it not with wisdom of words. Well, he says, the reason I don't want to do it that way is because uh, that would cause the cross of Christ to be made of no effect. What you want the, the, to happen is that the cross of Christ has its full effect. You don't want to have it no effect. You want it to have an impact. And that's what Paul is saying. I, I want you, brethren, to have the full impact of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, you're going to stay divided. And if you stay divided, you're going to stay losers. Now what this church and every church and every Christian has got to always remember is when you get disoriented and when things are not spiritually growing and developing as you should on the inside, you may have lost sight of the standard. And you may have lost sight of the power of the cross of Christ and you've let it drift off or you let your minds drift off from it so that it doesn't have its full effect. Now verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now are you one of those who are perishing? Is the cross of Christ foolishness? Is something you don't grasp? I don't understand. That's nothing to me or is it very powerful to you? It's foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, the cross of Jesus Christ is the power of God. That's because if you lift Jesus up, that's because there's power you see in that. And it draws you to God. Now the importance of holding up the hands of those who hold up the message of the cross is extremely important. Not only individually, but collectively. The message of the cross is God's way of putting power into the hearts. Now, individually, we've got to experience that. We've got to understand that. That the message of the cross gives power to me. And it must give power to each person. What kind of power? Well, it gives you spiritual power. When preachers and churches get tired of holding up the cross alone and we think that we need something else, we're letting it down. And what's going to happen is what we're seeing happen in our society today is that people have gone off to entertainment. They've gone off in all kinds of directions that it's kind of like uh, you, you go where, the, what, where people are, are drawn to a, something that's carnal and it doesn't have any spiritual power in it. We don't want that to happen here. And we don't want that to happen inside of us. When preachers and churches get tired of the old gospel, we are losing our way and we're going to lose in life. So we've got to always think, well, where am I now? I've gotten disoriented. Where's the cross? And then when you see the cross, you get back to it. Get back to it. Don't let yourself drift off and keep drifting 
away from it. You got to get back to it. If you're getting disoriented and getting discouraged, you got to get back because the power is not in man. The power is in the Word of God. And that's got to be our point of unity. That's where we all have the same mind. I think that's true. I think what you said is exactly right. That that's exactly what I need. That's what we all need. And we all agree. That's the rallying point. When you get disoriented and you're divided, your rallying point of unity is not in man who will disappoint you and who will discourage you. Your rallying point is the banner of the cross. You hold it up when everything else seems to be falling apart. When everything around you says that you're losing and you're losing spiritual ground, you've got to always know where your flag is and rally to it. So when this church wins or loses, and let's say this, at Corinth, I think uh, Brother Andrew had an excellent lesson this morning. Brought some illustrations out of Corinth. And we just brought one too in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The man who had his father's wife, that man was disoriented. He had forgotten what his life was about. The church there was disoriented. When they did finally wake up and say, well, we've got, to, we've got to say, we've got to make a statement that we don't, we don't put up with sexual immorality. That we stand against that. We're not standing with you anymore. And the man wakes up and says, I'm all alone now. And he repents and he comes back. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 apparently refers to that. And he says, now you did the right thing. You withdrew from him and he repented and he came back and he made things right. So things are, except this, you've got to now reaffirm that you love him. And you've got to assure him that you're for him, that you're not against him. And then he says, because we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. What's that mean? Well, Satan's got tricks. He'd like us to start pulling apart. He would like us to divide. He would like us to be a source of discouragement rather than encouragement. When this church wins or loses, it's because we forgot Satan's working on discouragement. That's his his deal. That's what he's all about. When we fall, it's because we fail to lift up the cross. We forgot where the banner was. We forgot where the rallying point is. We forgot where the power is. And we become defeated again. Now that's individually. I I can't do that for you. You can't do that for me. As individuals, we're each responsible to make sure that the cross of Jesus Christ is effectively working in us. And then if it works in the individuals, then it can spread and the church of Jesus Christ will be a winning body of people. And we've got to make sure that we're that. As long as Jesus is lifted high and you don't forget that's what you're about. That above all the battles that you face in life, You're going to win as long as you know that banner is lifted up. And it's lifted up on your behalf and you fight under that battle. You strive under that battle or that banner. In summary, we saw back in Exodus chapter 17, verse 11. Let's get back to that. Exodus chapter 17. Verse 11, and so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. Who prevails in our battle of life? 
It depends entirely on if and when we are still holding up the cross of Jesus Christ. I hope you see that. You see that? That you are going to win individually and us collectively as long as we are not so disoriented that we forget where the banner is, where the power is. Second of all, verse 12, but Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. We must support whoever is holding up the gospel. I'm not just talking about just the preachers and just the elders, but I'm certainly including them. That we must support whoever is holding up the gospel, God's power. Don't discourage them from that. It's heavy enough for them to feel that sometimes they feel alone. They don't need to feel that. It is our responsibility to fight. And it is our responsibility to help hold up the hands of those who preach and teach the cross of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, verse 15, keep a permanent reminder, the Lord is my banner. I've got to remember that. The Lord, not man, not a preacher, not a particular elder, or not a, not a particular favorite member of the church, but my banner is the Lord. Now, if, you don't, if you don't get anything else out of this, leave here with this on your mind and repeat it to yourself over and over. The Lord is my banner. What does that mean? That means I'm going to hold up the standard so that I'll always know what I've got to go to, where my power, where my resources is, so I can be oriented. I can be, I can get back my focus. I can get back my spiritual power and my energy. I can keep a permanent reminder. It's not me by myself. It's the Lord. The Lord is my banner. Those are the ways that the early disciples were victorious, both in example and in life, is because they kept, those who won, kept the Lord as their banner. If you'd like to be a part of that on the winning side, that's what we're, this lesson is basically be, uh, about, is that it just says you've got to make the Lord the center. You've got to hold Him up. And if we can help you get started with that, then you have to believe in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, be baptized into union with Him, and then walk out new life with Him, holding Him up as the banner of your life. Can we help you get started? If so, please.